print-on-demand services have done wonderful things for the availability and viability of niche material in physical formats. There are many books available print-on-demand that would have tremendous difficulty justifying a traditional print run, let alone proper retail distribution, financially. What does the technology enable when extended to other formats, though? When I saw that playing cards were now available print-on-demand from DriveThruRPG, I knew eventually I'd have to give them a fair shake, or shuffle, see how they stack up against their traditional brethren, and share my thoughts on the implications. First consideration is the price point. Obviously this will vary by publisher, but seeing Wizards of the Coast price a 120 card deck at 20 US dollars was a pleasant surprise given their pricing on CCGs. A standard 54 card deck seems to run around 10 dollars most often. Some decks can be purchased with printed tuck boxes at an extra cost, but the products I was most interested in didn't offer them, so I ordered clear plastic cases to go with them for one dollar each. The shipping was the most painful cost to consider, at 16 US dollars for me, but that will naturally vary based on where you live, so I feel uncomfortable criticizing cost based on that. A reasonable price doesn't mean much if the product isn't up to snuff, though, so let's move along to the substance of the thing. From the outset, the cards immediately set my mind at ease. They succeed somewhere that print-on-demand books never quite have for me, in that they feel like a traditionally produced product. The stock is good, the printing is clear, and they feel right in the hand. The cards manipulate as I would expect them to. They don't have an elaborate coating, but then plenty of traditionally printed cards don't. These are almost without issue. Almost. Before I nitpick, though, I want to speak specifically to the products I ordered. Of the three decks I ordered, two of them were reference cards for the 20th anniversary of Shadowrun. These are cards containing stats for firearms, or drones and vehicles, as well as illustrations for each. Shadowrun is a complicated enough game that I like the idea of having as much in the way of supporting game aids as I can if I ever run it. Of course, even had these been traditionally printed, I probably wouldn't be able to find them in stores now, since the addition of the game these support is no longer in print. The 20th anniversary edition of Shadowrun was a slight revision of the 4th edition, but the full-fledged 5th edition has already been out for years. Still, on a whim, I can order accessories for an older game produced for me. I think that's pretty great. The final deck I ordered is something I find even more exciting, though. In 2010, Wizards of the Coast released the 7th edition of Gamma World, this time basing it largely on the 4th edition of Dungeons & Dragons. It was released as a boxed set, featuring both mutations and equipment that were to be randomly distributed at certain times in play from the included deck of cards, optionally, and controversially, augmented by cards purchased in randomized booster packs. A lot of people were disgusted at Wizards of the Coast for attempting to inject their CCG business model into a role-playing game. I wasn't a fan of the idea either, but the box set already seemed to include an ample enough deck, so I picked up a copy once I started seeing them appear on Liquidation. I didn't ever think I'd own more of the additional cards than the one booster they included in the base game, in hopes of getting folks acclimatized to the idea. That is, until I saw that they were now advertising the full 120 card set for $20 print-on-demand. To put that in context, 
These things were sold in blind boosters of eight cards for three ninety nine. Each card has a rarity, and there were five commons, two uncommons, and one rare to a pack. In the full set of possible cards, there are forty commons, forty uncommons, and forty rares. This means that even someone with perfect luck, if buying boosters individually, would need to spend over $150 to get them all. Here is a full set, without the aggravation, for $20. Here is a company that has, through this service, been able to not only continue to monetize one of their older products, but do so in a less exploitative and frustrating way than they had originally. I'm impressed. The question does arise, though. Are these cards similar enough to the originals to be shuffled in together? The stock, size, and feel is similar, and any differences in finish are difficult to distinguish. There is one issue that might be a deal-breaker to someone out there, though. Color variation. While the traditionally printed cards in the base deck and booster that came with my copy of Camel World all have a fairly uniform coloration, those from the print-on-demand deck are sometimes brighter or darker, and it varies from card to card. It could be argued that this variation means that the cards are essentially marked from the outset. While this probably doesn't matter much for non-competitive games, like Gamma World, if a conventional card game featured this variation, I could see this being considered an upsetting flaw. Of course, card protectors with opaque backs are already quite popular among players of those games, so perhaps it would be a non-issue for many, even in that setting. I can't even be certain that this color variance is something that appears across the board with these print-on-demand cards, though. If it's present at all in the Shadowrun cards I ordered, it's much more difficult to notice. All in all, I'm pleased with the results. Actually, I'd go so far as to say I'm happier with these than I am with the print-on-demand books I've received. As a side note, the cards are produced in a separate facility from the books, so if you're looking to order a mix of books and cards, they have to be shipped separately, which gets expensive. If they shipped from the same place, I'd be much more inclined to toss a deck or two into my next order of books, or vice versa. It's probably worth noting that the plastic cases that are sold on the site are surprisingly nice. They're worth the extra dollar in my eyes, rather than relying on the little plastic band that the cards ship with otherwise. I'm hopeful that the flexibility that print-on-demand cards allows publishers leaves developers feeling a little more at liberty to experiment with really modular game design. Unbound rules have some serious advantages when it comes to deciding what to include and what not to include in your game. And if there's something that you want to emphasize for your players, you can just Pull the rule out and put it on the table in front of them, visible and ready for reference. That's really appealing to me. Now I've been looking at this pretty exclusively in this video from an RPG player's perspective, but naturally there are loads of card games out there. And if someone's an independent game designer and is looking for a platform, Drive through RPG's sister site, Drive through Cards, might be a good place for that. Or for a designer to be able to experiment, to try something new, to take a creative risk without making it a financial risk. It's appealing just to have that burden of distribution and manufacturing taken off of the shoulders. I'm really interested in seeing what becomes of that. To me, that's, that's the main thrust of what this whole print-on-demand thing is about. That's 
kind of the revolution in it. I'm interested to see what the next formats will be like for print on demand. What new options will come into the fore. Even if they're just little ones. Things that you would think would be kind of insignificant in the grand scheme, like having different shaped cutting dies. I mean, if they're doing playing cards, surely they could produce other paper or maybe even thicker card formats. Um, character tokens. If they had a round die, they could produce these little babies. Or pogs. People are waiting for pogs to come back, you know.